I suppose it's um, a bit of a, a barometer of what Nuffield does to a person, is, is sort of um, the journey that I've been on over the last 20 years. So I'm, I suppose to give you a bit of background, I put my study topic up there so you can see what, where my mind was uh, yeah, a long time, I can't even think, 20 years ago, you know, when I was thinking of applying for Nuffield Scholarship, I was in my early 20, uh, 27, 28. Um, so I'm half Zimbabwe and half Australian now, as of, as of this year. I've spent 20 years of my life in Zimbabwe and 20 years of my life in Australia. Um, I suppose since, uh, since moving to Australia, um, I've had a, a very strong focus of looking forward. Um, and I suppose I've done anything but sit still. Um, and, and people are always amazed how I managed to juggle so many completely contradictory sort of businesses. But I, hopefully I can help explain how Nuffield set me on a trajectory by setting a path, uh, or a 10-year strategic plan for, for our, uh, I suppose, this building a new life in a new country. So I'll take you through some of the, some of the interesting things that we've ex explored. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily relate to what I studied because I've ended up in so many different areas that um, it was Nuffield that provided me that outlook on life to believe that anything is possible and, and go searching for areas in which people wouldn't expect you to search. Um, so I suppose we operate uh, four businesses um, up in Bundaberg. Uh, biofilm crop protection is our microbial uh, business, so we, we do single strain organism production. Uh, Hortus Technical Services is our NATA and ASPAC accredited laboratory um, with, with licensed laboratories in, in uh, Japan and the US. Uh, the brew house is our uh, hospitality venue, um, so we're opening up a chain of, of brew house um, tap rooms and production facilities up and down the east coast, and Begara Brewing Company is our beverage, uh, beverage brand. Uh, so to haunt us firstly, so I suppose we, um, when, I, when I came to, um, to Australia, I finished university and went to work for a company called CropTech up in Bundaberg. Um, and fantastic business. Unfortunately, after two, three years of working there, um, it ended up being sold to T-Systems, and then um, T-Systems was bought by John Deere. Um, anyway, a few years later, after I'd worked um, for, for Ausveg as the Northern Industry Development Manager for Horticulture, um, the, the original CropTech business came up for sale, and um, opportunistically, we you know, it was straight after the GFC and I had just finished my Nuffield. I'd, I was on the farm and when, when I did my scholarship, I was a, a medium scale um, passion fruit, low chill stone fruit and um, custard apple farmer on the Sunshine Coast. And, you know, full of enthusiasm to grow and get bigger and, and but, it, you know, the sector that I was working, there wasn't a lot of room for expansion. We'd already done value adding. We were... Um, exporting to Russia, we were, you know, I suppose, trying to beat down the, the door any, any which direction. And um, this opportunity arose where I started exporting table grapes uh, to utilize the, the network of people I'd met in China on my Nuffield scholarship. I started working with um, a group of growers in Mildura to export their table grapes into Hong Kong. And, and then, uh, yeah, onwards from there. But. Um, anyway, we end up purchasing Hortus, uh, or purchasing CropTech and rebranding it to Hortus. So I suppose it taught me through Nuffield to think big. Um, and so I was buying a business off John Deere was something that I'd never considered as a, a, a I suppose, a, a refugee. I, oh, my wife says you shouldn't call yourself a refugee. No. But, you know, we, we were kicked off our farm. We, we had to come here with nothing and start again. So. I think the only difference is your mindset and what you think you can achieve, you know, looking forward as opposed to, you know, crying over spilled milk looking backwards. So, so we're really fortunate to buy the business and, um, yeah, I mean, we, we immediately increased our revenue tenfold. So it was quite a, a big jump in managing staff and multiple sites and licensees and, and I still didn't actually have the foggiest idea 
what the lab business was, but I knew there was a good group of people working it, and I thought, well, I'll just try and steer the ship and, and keep out of the way, and then add value where I can. Um, so since that time, we, we've moved three times, uh, each time into a bigger and, and, and better facility. We're now um, the only NATA and ASPAC accredited laboratory in Queensland, um, servicing growers you know, nationally. Um, we've recently licensed our technology into uh, Mildura to service southern Australia, so we've got a southern base and a northern base. Uh, and then we've been operating in the US for two years out of Michigan, um, so through New Age Labs. Um, being one of the fastest growing sectors is sap testing, so for rapid analysis of nutrients to, to monitor crop performance. Um, and this has been brought about by, you know, opportunistic timing with, with low orbital satellites and, and NDVIs or biomass mapping and using sap analysis as a 24-hour turnaround to determine efficacy of different treatments that you might put on a crop. So um, we've got a 35-year-old database of optimal ranges for soil, sap, soil solution that we've been accumulating. Um, we've now systemized and, and we're now licensed to, to countries around the world. Um, I suppose the, you know, the diversity of crops we now deal with, and I've just put a snapshot, you know, we're across the supply chain. We, we work with um, you know, distributors, product companies, growers, um, marketing entities, um, and you know, I suppose we're positioned in in a in a in an industry where we're servicing horticulture, but our expertise in horticulture has taken us to to lots of other industries, to mine site rehabilitation, uh, you know, to to pasture research. Um, you know, we're, we're even now in, in wastewater treatment facilities, and and we're doing. Uh, hospitality, testing for food safety. So I suppose we broaden our expertise as a scientific company. Um, and yeah, and you know, I suppose since, since Nuffield, I've continued this learning journey where we've you know, actively gone overseas, gone, you know, that pictures with the Cravo guys in California. And we went with a group of growers over to Mexico to look at a 40 hectare retractable roof greenhouse with Cravo. Um, and then you know, come back and have the first one built in Bundaberg that we then oversee the management of you know, a range of different crops under, under that semi-protected cropping system or, or hy hybrid production model. Um, you know, we're learning a lot about blueberries. That's a, a photo of some uh, blueberries in Michigan. Um, and obviously, this is our global IP company that we retain that server and database and software, and, and this is going to be critical, you know, I suppose, for Queensland in the rollout of the reef legislation. We have to manage a lot of that data as a NITRA accredited lab. Um, samples will be submitted via a number of different um, user interfaces or portals, um, but the engine, you know, we're, we're the engine room of a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of different organizations, and I, I like to think we're the the Windows operating system behind horticulture that we, we can provide um, some artificial intelligence and, and fantastic um, insights to enable agronomists, farm managers, marketing companies to, to use the information that we produce um, within their production systems to improve um, the efficiency of, of crop, protect, crop production inputs. So, so we're about facilitating an improvement of how you use your, your resources. Um, so we, we, we then moved on to, um, well, I, it goes in a couple of steps, but we, we got into fermentation, and I'll explain why I've presented beer first, because it, part of Nuffield, my topic was to look at value-adding horticultural production, horticultural output. So, um, you know, at the time I was growing passion fruit, and I was thinking, right, I've got to put it in a sachet or, you know, something so it's ready to process, or, you know, alter the packaging, uh, and, that, and then, you know, looked heavily into food and beverages and how to value add, and um, yeah, I suppose where I landed was beer, because you've got to pick something you're passionate about, and um, yeah, there, there's a few other reasons why I settled on beer. One was the, the risks associated with climate change, and the lack of control that I saw so many when, when we were farming, as well as then as an agronomy company servicing an entire industry of horticulture. Um, yeah, the, the risks from season to season and the variability and the lack of control. Um, for me, the complete opposite was moving into a 
temperature controlled, jacketed, fermented, stainless steel fermenter where I had absolute control. Um, using a quality system with our laboratory where we could isolate specific single strain organisms, inoculate, maintain temperature, ferment to a specific level, put it in a product for which we own the brand and then sell it to a consumer. So I had complete vertical supply chain control over the delivery of a value added horticultural product. Um, and then within that, the aim was to incorporate, um, and, and again, this was through sort of the, my thinking in formulating a Nuffield study topic, using renewable energy as the backbone uh, and reinvigorating regional economies and um, with environmental responsibility. So we, we were the first brewery, we make all of our beer on rainwater. So we had to internalize all the, all the downpipes and capture the water off the roof so that that forms the basis of our beer. So we've got nice clean water. We then um, you know, look for points of differentiation that are unassailable. So um, I noted there, there's a few points with the gluten-free beer. The problem with Australia is that the, we're so heavily regulated that um, we can't call anything gluten-free if it comes from a, a a gluten containing organism, a gluten, gluten containing product. So, barley, because it uh, contains gluten, we can't use the word gluten free. Um, you have to use something that, does, that doesn't contain any. But we, we ended up getting around that. We released Ray XPA, which um, was a partnership with Lady Elliot Island um, as a home of manta rays. And, and the reason we chose them, we wanted an iconic location on the reef. It's, you know, it's a, the, the reef is a global icon, so a brand association with a global icon um, in partnership with a destination that people could actually go to. Um, and having grown up on a game ranch in Zimbabwe, um, the next, you know, the equivalent for me was m contributing to conservation of uh, wildlife on the reef. So, so, you know, the giants of the sea with manta rays, it, it was a perfect sort of partnership. And, um, anyway, we ended up using the science in our in our um, in Hortus to work out um, what sort of glutenase reduction enzyme we could put into into beer. So, combi combining a beer style, which is a extra pale ale, so you've got a much lower malt bill, with the glutenase reduction enzyme, and then we test it through the National Measurement Institute, and then in our batch and bottling date, we put contains less than five ppm glutenase so that Celiacs Australia and anybody that drinks that beer, even though it says low gluten on the label, it tastes like a proper beer, and it's, um, you know, the style has contributed to it, but we're incorporating science and then informing the consumer as to, you know, the, to what it is. Um, so I suppose we, we're continually looking for those little points of difference. Um, the other, other reason for the brewery was that to, uh, instead of exporting our revenue from regional Australia and, and drinking foreign owned brands and sending that revenue offshore, um, I wanted to retain that revenue in regional Australia. So instead of um, you know, drinking a foreign owned beer and the profits leaving, um, let's make the beer here, let's buy local ingredients, let's uh, you know, host events, do product launches, uh, and I suppose that's, you know, that's seen us do relatively well in, in regard to supply up and down the coast. So we now supply through BWS and Dan Murphy's uh, Queensland wide. Um, and, and yeah, I suppose we've started diversifying what we do. Um, so we do a lot of special event uh, brewing now. So for example, we recently hosted the Pop-Up Polo in Bundaberg. And so we curated a specific beer for that event. Um, uh, you know, understanding the market and creating a value-added um, product that, you know, I suppose you've got to really delve into the minds of what you, you know, what you're trying to achieve. And there's a, f a few points here which I want to dwell on. So um, I'll, I want to take to toss. I, I disagree in the fact that there's no n more noble profession than the production of food because I think the production of beer is slightly more noble. <laughs> <laughs> but for another point, in that it's value-adding food. So we've got to get better in Australia at, at capturing a greater proportion of the value chain. And the further you move away from the base commodity and closer to the final finished value-added product, the more value we will retain in our supply chain and in, therefore in our economies. So we've got to go right to the consumer and then tailor a product. So Saison Silver is, was a product of 
um, consumer research, so um, we wanted to target a female demographic beer drinker. Um, the, the key thing, they won't drink a beer um, that's going to be fattening. So it had to be a low-carb beer. And this is as a result of talking to lots of mums at school, lots of, you know, just talking to people and understanding what they, what's important to them. Secondly, it has to look fantastic. If you're going to spend a fortune on a, a nice dress to go to the polo, you don't want to, you want to have a beer label that looks fantastic. Um, so we, you know, simplicity of black and white and silver. Um, thirdly, we wanted brand association. So, um, you know, we, we don't have the marketing budget of Peroni, um, but we've got the ability and the agility to position our product as um, through brand association with Land Rover, with Peroni, with Polo. So immediately, the the perception of our product is that it it's it's schmick, it's fancy. Um, you then can't let the consumer down. So we did a lot of research and to produce an ultra low carb, low ABV beer, we're the first to release, uh, it's called Saison Silver. We culture all of our own yeast in our microbiology company. Um, and, you know, we're, we're breaking the rules. We're, we're, we're producing a style of beer that's not normally produced in that way. So we're challenging convention all the time, um, using brand association and then positioning at a product launch um, where we get direct consumer exposure to a, a value-added product. Um, yeah, so I suppose that's a, a bit of that, and then and targeting the branding specific to to a market. So Millbank Arms was actually a family um, property settled in 1690 in the UK, so that's where my grandfather was born. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't, you know, it doesn't really bother me that I've, I've ended up here and have a fantastic time. But because he was the youngest of four sons, that's how I ended up moving to Africa, because after World War II, there was no more opportunity in England, so I ended up moving to Kenya, and then moving to Rhodesia, and then, and then us getting kicked out of Rhodesia and Zimbabwe, and then moving here. But ironically, we ended up, uh, my cousin Ed, who I used to go on holidays with when I was a kid, he's now taken over Barningham Estate in the north of England, uh, and he's completely renovated the Millbank Arms, which was first licensed as a as a as a on Barnium Estate in, in 1690. Um, so for the grand opening, we've, we actually brewed the Millbank Arms house beer in Australia and has exported it to, um, back to Yorkshire. So, you know, you can sell ice to Eskimos. So we, we've, made a <laughs> we've made an English special bitter in Australia, incorporated some of our own ingredients, improved the recipe a bit, and sent it back to England for them to drink in a pub that was opened a couple of centuries ago. Um, the, the next one I just want to touch on is, is what I learned about cross-media marketing. So um, we're challenging convention as to how to get a message out to people all the time. So you'll see the, the Thirsty Turtle novel lager label I've got down there. So what we're working th with this is how to leverage using beer as a vehicle for a conversation. So a lot of the, the conventions I go to or, or things, it's um, beer is the, is the side uh, topic of or is something you just have while having a conversation with somebody else. So the idea of this was to position a product on a beer label as advertising real estate, but with a QR code that linked it to a specific product that somebody could purchase during uh, during that uh, time that they're having a cold beer. So. We looked at you know similar market demographics, and the the author for this book said, you know what, the, this we and we did the book launch for him at the brewery, um, and he said we have very similar markets that we're actually targeting. You know the people that are going to read my book are the sorts of people that are going to drink your beer, and I went sure, well let's cross promote the two. So we now have a brand ambassador that's that's doing the tastings at Dan Murphy's um, with the the book cover that they can then scan with a QR code on their phone and start reading his or buy his book off Amazon um, as a result of purchasing a beer. So I now have created a, a cross-promotional multimedia marketing uh, platform, which is a, a beer that now enables us with a platform to put any product on there and have that as the carrier. So, for example, we're, we're releasing a range of them coming up to this Christmas that will link to different products that we work with in the agricultural sector. 
So you can imagine you can start to incorporate ingredients in that beer that those companies might be involved in the production of and, and sell that story as to how they, how they go about things. Um, yeah, and I suppose, you know, when we talk about the delicatessen of Asia, um, you know, we've targeted specific cities. We went with a fairly broad strategy to, we supplied um, Home Plus across South Korea. I think there was 150 supermarkets. Uh, we're now being far more nuanced and targeting specific retail venues. So in Singapore, we, we, su we supply a chain of six bars um, that have got heaps of attitude, uh, very, you know, I suppose the, the cool end of town because we want to be positioned in little speakeasy gin bars where the perceived value, so one of our beers sells for fifth, the equivalent of $15 a stubby. So we've got to be making sure that the quality of our production is there um, and targeted in the right position. Um, this is just to follow on, so we, we now have these retail venues, so we're recently signing up two more. And um, I suppose this is just the, the platform for which we are able to display local produce, tell the story, engage with consumers, uh, and we do host, you know, work functions, product launches, VIP parties, um, you know, it's, it's an ability. So down there you'll see the Taste Bundaberg mural. So I, I got together five main producers that were our clients in Bundaberg to contribute to, you know, murals, so as a place activation. So we're, we're engaging in the arts as well as the sciences. Um, yeah, and I, I suppose a bit of thing about the media, one of the notes that I had here was to verbalize your goals. As a scholar, as you move forward, you're going to, you know, be nervous about taking the next step or saying, I'm going to do this or should I do this or, and, you know, all I can say is I wasn't actually going to build the brewery and I got asked to be a guest speaker at a breakfast and, and I was actually just saying this is what we should do. And, and then the media descended on me and said, oh, we hear you're building a brewery. I went, mean, oh God, well I suppose I better do it now. But, <laughs> you know, so by verbalizing it, it then reinforces the necessity to, to take action. And I think that's what we, we lack. If you um, don't expect too much and you won't be disappointed. We're, constantly expecting somebody else and government to do something for us, if we just get off our backside and do it, um, don't worry about anybody else, you know, then eventually if someone comes along and helps you, fantastic. But if you, you know, go forward expecting nothing and, um, you know, and I suppose this is a, a common thread that I've found, um, anyway, but I'm happy to talk about it more in a bit. Um, so finally, I suppose we, you know, biofilm was the... Uh, you know, where we have some fantastic uh, growth potential. So um, we've targeted this specialty microbial product fermentation uh, and really delving into the, this new world of discovery of um, both metabolites produced by microorganisms as well as the, the microorganism themselves as well as combinations and blends of them. So uh, we're now one of the largest importers of single strain organisms from, uh, and, and was, as well as isolating them from within Australia. So through our pathology lab, um, we'll get samples of fusarium that we'll isolate, we'll grow into a pure culture, uh, and then DNA sequence, and then start challenge plating with existing organisms in our library for potential biocontrol agents. Um, and that, this spans across um, yeasts, bacteria, fungi, all, all little bugs, and, and everything usually fermented, but then how we deploy those products in different ways. So, for example, we're uh, working with mine site rehabilitation in South Africa where we will um, inoculate wood fiber uh, in, in um, uh, wood fiber bales that will go into a hydromulcher that we spray on, onto bare earth so that we provide a tacker fire, wood fiber, inoculant to stimulate germination of the, whatever regenerative seed we're putting out. Um, and, you know, but that specific specificity of biology that we add to a carrier um, can then change across different things. So whether it's uh, a phosphorus solubi solubilizer for capturing runoff off a cane farm so that prior to water leaving a farm, it passes through a, um, a catchment facility that has biology to digest it. Um, so we, you know, and obviously we're, we're working with this pasture dieback project with, with MLA and, and investigating how we can incorporate different uh, entomopathogenic fungi to potentially control uh, the mealybug that's one of the causal agents. 
Um, so this is, you know, I suppose commercialization. Just keep, uh, you know, we keep driving and setting small goals as we go and um, release a product, um, you know, based on the best available science at the time. Just because you're not at the end goal doesn't mean that you should stop. Uh, you know, release what you can based on what you know with the best available science that's consulted upon widely. Um, you know, and we've been, we started out with one product, which was a bacillus. We, we've now got a huge portfolio that we're rolling out across the country, as well as doing, you know, registration work and all NASA certified organic so that we've got broad ability to use. Uh, and I just wanted to, I suppose, to, in finishing up, um, refer back to you know, the journey where it all starts. So um, I don't know if you can see the top picture there, but where, 20 years ago, my, my dad was, um, because that's what was available and because the locals had jongos, which are those cattle uh, plowing, uh, you know, that's, that's on the farm with the, all the workers, you know, but in, the, in a space of 20 years, we can go from um, plowing a field with two cattle to isolating specific strains of entomopathogenic fungi to control particular organisms that are affecting, I think, 30 million hectares across Queensland. Um, you can see down there, there's a little guy in the background drinking a beer. That's me, age 13, on the Zambezi. So beer's been in my system since uh, for a long time. <laughs> Um, yeah, and that, that was some of our, that was our cattle, you know, we have beef masters in Zim. Uh, and then, you know, be grateful for what you have because, you know, I suppose we're never afraid, afraid to innovate and take on new challenges and do things because you never know when you could lose it all. So there, there's, you know, we were breeding up game for, you know, in our, our 3,000 hectare game ranch. Um, in the space of three years, starting university to finishing our entire game farm, you know, everything was killed. So you then have to, you know, so that's one of our prized stable bulls. What we used to do was cull the bulls to American tourists for $10,000 a head. So I'd take horseback safaris. So while I was at university, you know, people just went and killed all the animals. And so you, you end up going, well, that wasn't very smart. <laughs> you know, we've got to, uh, I suppose, remember where we've come from, remain focused on where you're headed, uh, look forward and, and don't be afraid to take on things, don't expect to be given anything, unless you work for it you're not going to get it and I, I think Nuffield is one of the most fantastic organisations to set you on that trajectory, to, to position your long-term goals where you want to go and um, yeah, enjoy and make the most of it. Thank you. <laughs>